The next item of business is a debate on motion 12958 in the name of Annabel Ewing on prescription Scotland bill. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion, Minister. Formally moved. Thank you. I call on Alison de Rolis, Solicitor General, to speak to the motion. Nine minutes, please, Solicitor General. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of the Scottish Government to open this debate on the general principles of the Prescription Scotland Bill, which began as part of the Scottish Law Commission's ninth programme of law reform. I'd like to take this time to thank those who gave evidence, the convener and members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and particularly the work of the Scottish Law Commission, whose report uh, included the draft of the bill. This bill will be taken forward by the new Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Minister for Community Safety, following their formal appointment subject to Parliament's approval tomorrow. The Scottish Government welcomes the Committee's support for the general principles of this bill and their recognition that it will provide clarity and legal certainty in those areas of negative prescription that have caused practical difficulties for creditors and debtors alike in Scotland. The bill began as part of the Scottish Law Commission's ninth programme of law reform, and its aim is to increase clarity, legal certainty, and fairness in the law of negative prescription. In civil law, that doctrine serves a vital function. It sets time limits for when obligations and correlative rights are extinguished. This serves the interests of individuals, where after a certain lapse of time, it is fairer to deprive one of a right rather than allow it to trouble the other. And it also serves the public interest because litigation begun promptly encourages legal certainty. It's probably worth briefly revisiting the intentions of the bill, which were to resolve certain issues with the law of negative prescription that have caused practical difficulty. These were deemed to be worthy and welcome reforms to this particular aspect of the law. And that's something we should perhaps bear in mind when we debate the principles of this bill this afternoon. So what does the bill do? Well, by extending the five-year negative prescription period to cover all statutory obligations to make payment, this bill significantly simplifies the law in this area. Currently, the 1973 Act lists specific categories of obligation that are subject to the five-year prescriptive period. The consequence is that that list needs to be constantly updated if new obligations are to come under the five-year prescription. At the same time, there are currently statutory obligations that don't come under the five-year prescription, but where there are no policy grounds to explain or justify this. There are exceptions to this new rule, such as taxes, council tax, and DWP overpayments. In other words, generally those statutory obligations of a public law nature. Negative prescription is about the extinction of obligations after they become enforceable. But it's difficult to say that there's an enforceable obligation unless you know who to enforce it against. In the case of seeking damages, it is, after all, only fair that if you don't know who was responsible for your loss, injury or damage, time should not run against you until you do know or can reasonably be expected to know. Section 5 of the Bill ju does just that. It makes little sense to postpone the start of prescription when the creditor becomes aware of the cause of their loss, yet unaware of the identity of those responsible. The Scottish Government welcomes the Committee's recognition that the new test proposed in this Bill achieves a fair balance between the interests of the creditor and the debtor. While it seems fair to creditors to allow them some time to discover the identity of the person responsible for their loss or damage, it is also fair to defenders that time does not carry on indefinitely against them. An unusual feature of Scots law is that both the five-year and 20-year prescription for obligations to pay damages run from the same date, that is the date of the loss. Another unusual feature is that the 20-year prescription can be interrupted with the effect that the 20-year period starts again, and so it's possible for a very, very long time to pass before an obligation finally prescribes. The bill will make the 20-year prescription in relation to obligations to pay damages commence on the date of the act or omission giving rise to the loss. The bill will also make the 20-year prescription a true long stop by preventing it from being restarted. The committee, along with a number of those who gave evidence at stage one, agree with the Scottish Government that such provision increases legal certainty and clarity. And the committee also recognises the logic in allowing the prescription period to continue until proceedings finish, where that happens after the end of the 20-year period. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, a good deal of time has been spent on what this bill doesn't do as opposed to what it does. And what it does is simply maintains the exceptions that already exist under current Scots law. With respect to council tax and non-domestic rates, this bill does not seek to change the current position as it is generally understood. Local taxes are vital sources of income for local authorities in the same way that other taxes are vital sources of income for the Scottish and UK governments. And the Scottish Government would not wish, uh, as the SLC indicated, to differentiate the treatment of local taxation payments from all other tax payments. Um, thank you. I'd, I'd like to, let, to make progress if that's all right at this stage. COSLA have told the committee that it is rare for action to be taken to recover a debt more than five years old. But any move to a five-year negative prescription period would, just like the DWP, hurt the debtor most. Payments would either have to be recovered over a shorter period of time, remembering always that local taxes are recurring obligations due every year, so failure to make payment one year is likely to be compounded the following, or councils would have to change the way they try and pursue and enforce payment, leading to substantially increased costs for councils, for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and more importantly, to the debtors themselves. From the committee's report, the Scottish Government note that the committee has agreed to write to all 32 local authorities for more information about such debts. Reserved social security spending in Scotland is still decided on the basis of rules set by the DWP, and this includes how they decide to recover any overpaid benefits. The DWP have made it very clear to the committee that if there was no exception from the five-year prescription for obligations to repay reserved benefit overpayments, debtors would be placed in a worse position than they are now, as the DWP would have to recover the money over a shorter period of time, meaning that larger amounts would require to be deducted from a debtor's benefits over a shorter period. The Scottish Government does not have any jurisdiction over policy decisions concerning the operation of reserved benefits, and the committee are keen not to increase the financial hardship on vulnerable people in our society. D D DWP is in control of the matter, and the Scottish Government hope that the committee will join them in recognising the impact making reserve benefit over payments subject to the five-year prescription would have. Um, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to press on for, for now. Thank you. As well as those mentioned um, already, the bill also makes some miscellaneous provisions which I want to briefly mention before time runs out. Firstly, the bill allows for agreements to extend the five-year prescription by no more than one year in order to allow parties time to negotiate an end to their dispute without the need for protective proceedings. The committee recognised the merit in these agreements and also the bill adds to the definition of relevant claim in order to take account of claims that are made in sequestrations and company administrations receivership. Uh, in conclusion of these opening remarks, um, Presiding Officer, I would once again like to thank the DPLRC for their scrutiny and support of the Bill's general principles. The approach taken in this Bill is not one of wholesale reform. Its aim is to focus on and address those particular areas that have caused difficulty in practice. The Scottish Government believes that this Bill strikes a fair balance overall, redressing cases of unfairness for creditors and debtors, whilst also serving the wider interests of fairness, justice, justice and certainty. And in these circumstances, I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Prescription Scotland Bill. Thank you. Solicitor General, I know you're not used to this, but uh, it's already been moved by Mr Fitzpatrick. <laughs> no, but it, it's... That's corroboration. Oh, yes, I was all in favour of corroboration. It got me in a lot of trouble. Uh, I call Graham Simpson, please. <laughs> I call Graham Simpson to speak, please, on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Convener, please, eight minutes. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also thank uh, Ms. Dirolo for stepping in today. Um, one of the responsibilities of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee is to scrutinise Scottish Law Commission bills. These bills can often be seen as quite technical and members may think our scrutiny is therefore quite turgid. And perhaps as convener, I've just gone a little native presiding officer, but the Prescription Scotland Bill has proved to be a thoroughly interesting, important and thought-provoking piece of legislation. I do appreciate that many members looking at today's business may not have previously given much thought to this bill. You may have felt that as a Scottish Law Commission bill, 
There's generally a wide degree of consensus among stakeholders for the need to reform the law and that any changes are fairly procedural and uncontroversial. Indeed, if you're asked to take part in this debate, you may have thought you just need to take your prescription and move on. You may even have thought it's about the prescriptions you get from your doctor. We've all had them, but thankfully very few of us have had anything to do with the prescriptions covered in this bill. There are some bills that you can really get stuck into. The planning bill, for instance. This one didn't appear at first glance to be one of those, but the DPLR committee did have to wrestle with some important policy areas, such as those around council tax and social security benefits, policy issues with potential implications for our constituents, issues affecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society, issues of justice for people who've suffered injustice. Let me give two examples that demonstrate why the bill is so important uh, and why it required our committee to give it such robust scrutiny. Before I do, uh, and for those members who are new to the legal term of prescription, I found a handy way of thinking about it to be the available time in which you're able to make a claim against loss. So if you miss the deadline, that's the prescription period. Your right is extinguished. You're sadly too late. Firstly, I'll turn to the case of Morrison versus ICL Plastics. This, as many members will remember with great sadness, stemmed from the tragic explosion at the Stockline Plastics Factory in Glasgow in May 2004, which saw nine employees killed and many left seriously injured. The case centered on a nearby business, David T. Morrison and Co., which had suffered significant damage from the explosion. However, when it sued ICL Plastics, who owned Stockline, for its loss, ICL defended the claim on the basis that it already prescribed. In essence, Mr. Morrison was told he was too late to receive justice. The case revolved around the interpretation of the existing legislation, that's the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973, and what was the start date, what start date was on which the loss, injury or damage occurred. While Morrison believed that the start date was in 2013, when it found out the explosion was ICL's fault, ICL argued that the start date had begun in 2004, when Morrison's had initially suffered the loss. The Supreme Court, by a majority of three to two, found in favor of ICL. The committee recognizes the impact that the Supreme Court's decision had on the law of prescription. We therefore agree with the bill's proposal in section five. This allows the pursuer to know who caused the loss before the prescription period begins. It will mean that in future, people like David Morrison trying to seek recompense for damage suffered due to negligence will not be told it is too late to pursue the ICLs of this world. And that's a welcome change to the law. Another example uh, might help explain section eight of the bill, which covers the start date for the longer 20 year prescription period. Under the bill, this will now start from the date the act or omission occurred, which led to the loss. Fenella Mason, head of construction and projects at the law firm Bernus Paul gave the helpful illustration of a problem with a large infrastructure project such as, uh, and I don't want to cause uh, any worry to the uh, current transport minister here, the Queensferry Crossing. Uh, Ms. Mason asked the committee to assume that back in 2008, one of the bridge's engineers produced a defective design. As the structure didn't open until 2017, uh, and it's not unusual for it to take 10 or 12 years for a problem to manifest itself, under this example, the right of the Scottish Government to sue for damages could be lost. The committee recognises that the start date for the 20-year prescription proposed in the bill might therefore result in some harsh cases. It was, however, persuaded by the argument that evidence can deteriorate considerably over time, which in turn can lead to difficulties when compiling a case. As a number of witnesses said in evidence, we have to draw a line somewhere. Deputy Presiding Officer, 
In the time available, uh, I've not been able to mention the important uh, welfare aspects which the committee wrestled with in the bill. We felt that these were of such significance that we wrote to the social security, justice, equalities, and human rights, and local government and communities committees to ask for their views on our work and if they had anything to add. I'm grateful for the, to those committees for their helpful responses, particularly given the very tight deadline we gave them. I'm sure some of my colleagues will pick up on, on these welfare issues in their own contributions. Before I close, can I thank all those who contributed to the committee's scrutiny of this bill, whether in writing or by appearing before the committee during one of our evidence sessions. As members know, a committee's scrutiny is only as good as the evidence it receives, and so we're grateful for the time and energy given to help us in our work. Um, I thank the, uh, the minister and her officials for the constructive way in which they engaged with the committee and for the Scottish Law Commission for proposing the bill. As a committee, we were a little concerned that the commission did not perhaps consult as widely as it could have done, and we've called on it to review its processes for future consultations. Can I also thank my fellow members uh, of the committee for their enthusiasm in grappling with the issues raised with the bill, by the bill. While there were a couple of areas where we couldn't reach agreement, I felt it was a great example of parliamentary scrutiny uh, where the committee wants to get the best legislation on the statute books as possible. I close, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, with the words of William Gladstone, who said that justice delayed is justice denied. The provisions of this bill will hopefully ensure that justice might not be completely denied due to the passage of time. And that is something that my committee, and indeed the whole chamber, will welcome. It will ensure greater fairness and equity in the civil justice system. And I commend the committee's report to the chamber. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. And I call on Alison Harris to open for the Conservatives. Six minutes, please, Ms. Harris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, let me simplify the meaning of prescription. Prescription under Scots law and prescription encourages people to enforce their rights swiftly and, it, and before it becomes too difficult for a person or indeed an organisation defending a claim to gather the appropriate evidence. As we've heard earlier from Graham Simpson, delay can cause the quality of vital evidence that may be available for use in a court case to diminish. The Prescription Scotland Bill aims to amend the law relating to the extinction of civil rights and obligations by the passage of time. For negative prescription, the 1973 Act established five-year and 20-year prescriptive periods. 20-year applies to all obligations other than those specifically excluded from it by other prescriptions in the 1973 Act. Five-year prescription applies to those obligations on one statutory list and not those obligations on a second statutory list in Schedule 1 of the 1973 Act. In practice, most obligations in Scots law end after five years. The bill, if enacted, would implement the Scottish Law Commission's recommendations on the law of prescription and amend the 1973 Act in relation to negative prescription only. This means you have a certain time frame in which to do something or it becomes time barred, compared with positive prescription where you need the time to pass in order to claim the right to it. The bill has three main proposals, which are technical areas of law. However, what I am about to say is just a general guide. Section 1 of the bill relates to the obligations to pay damages and obligations under the law of delict. Delict refers to the Scots law relating to types of civil law apart from breach of contract. It is a group of wrongful behaviours in relation to a person wronged who can obtain a legal remedy in the civil courts. It includes common law of negligence and also specific types of del delict, is that I'm saying correctly, such as defamation um, and occupier's liability. It is separate from the law of contract. Section two extends to the scope of the five-year prescription to include certain obligations associated with contracts. Section three sets out the general rule that statutory obligations to pay money are covered by the five-year prescription. However, there are some statutory obligations only covered by the 20-year prescription. 
The committee not only heard oral evidence, but evidence was taken from the legal profession, academics, welfare rights sector, Scottish Law Commission, and the minister in charge of the bill, and as was well Annabel Ewing, MSP. All those responded to the committee's call for evidence and who gave oral evidence to the committee agreed that the bill was necessary. Shepherd and Wedderburn, in their written evidence, agreed, saying, the bill will improve, clarify, certainty and fairness and overall resources would be more efficient and cost reduced and it is likely that advising clients on potential prescription will be less complex while still, while still not straightforward. Under the existing 1973 Act, the five-year prescription applies to those obligations uh, on one statutory list and, to, uh, sorry, on one, and not to those obligations on the secondary statutory list as detailed in the Act. The lists have been amended many times over the years, making the law extremely complex. Section 3 of the Bill would extend the five-year prescription to all statutory obligations to pay money with some exceptions that would remain within the scope of the 20-year prescription. These exceptions are taxes and duties recovered by HMRC and Revenue Scotland, council tax and non-domestic rates, as well as those sums connected with enforcement of these obligations, the obligation to pay child maintenance, and sums recoverable under the legislation relating to social security benefits and tax credits. There is some debate around these exemptions. For example, there appears to be some uncertainty under the current law about pres the prescription period relating to council tax and business rates debts. Under the current law, council tax and business rates are probably only covered by the 20 year prescription. Although there is no decided case in point, leading to some uncertainty in practice. It is not as clear cut as simply five or, 20, uh, five or 20 years when you consider the aspect of joint and several liability in situations where people genuinely believe that they have paid only to discover the debt is still outstanding and significantly more than the original amount. Joint and several liability is a general principle of Scots law but it is an area that people do not always appreciate the meaning of or the severity of the implications. The committee has recommended that the Scottish Government give further consideration to the exception for council tax and business rates and provide a more detailed description of the public policy arguments for the exception ahead of stage two. The committee also recognises that there are wider policy considerations in the bill, particularly in relation to welfare rights. Overall, the committee welcomes the greater certainty that the bill will provide for users of the law, and the committee agrees with the bill's aim to increase clarity, certainty and fairness to the law on negative prescription, and considers that the bill, as drafted, generally meets its aims. Deputy Presiding Officer, can I also thank the four committee members who responded to the questions that were put to them on the wider policy areas, and can I also thank the clerks on the committee for their time, patience and effort that has gone into guiding the members through this bill. Thank you. Okay, I call Daniel Johnson to open for the Labour Party. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin my remarks by registering my thanks to Michael Matheson and Annabel Ewing in light of the announced reshuffle. Over the course of the time that I've spent shadowing the justice brief, we have, of course, had some notable disagreements, whether it's police governance, BTP merger or repeal of the Football Act. There's also been some very uh, clear areas of constructive engagement, whether that's around the broad issues of prison reform, making sure that the, the judicial system and the criminal justice system works, or also more specific circumstances around the civil litigation bill. So I'd give thanks to both of them and wish them luck in their new roles. Um, I would also uh, like to welcome Humza Youssef, and I'm glad he's here this afternoon on the front bench, and Ash Denham to their new positions. And I look forward to engagement with them, be it constructive or indeed on occasion critical where need be. I must admit, presiding officer, that the Labour group were very excited to hear that there was going to be a debate this afternoon about prescription. Indeed, uh, the, the, the queue lined up so that we could talk about medication, pharmacies, and of course, on the anniversary of the NHS and very important health issues. When the, the, the truth uh, was revealed, I'm not sure we had quite the same ease in filling those slots, but the, the issues that are raised around debt and the length of time at which it's reasonable to pursue those debts 
are very important and have very real and human implications. And I think that these are important issues that we are debating here this afternoon. So in that regard, I'd like to thank the members and clerks of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for uh, their report. I think it has provided a useful basis uh, for this debate and also to the organisations who provided their briefings uh, that informed that. I'd also, of course, like to thank the Scottish Law Commission whose uh, work has uh, prompted uh, this uh, bill. Prescription is indeed a valuable principle in civil law. It ensures that people who are aggrieved face uh, a time limit in which they can raise a claim in court. This is important as it encourages people to enforce their rights promptly. Without, paper evidence, uh, without it, paper evidence could become lost, damaged or destroyed. Uh, witnesses may have died, become untraceable or simply uh, not remember the facts of the case. And above all else, it may lead people to be being pursued for debts under what any, uh, a length of time that anyone would consider simply unreasonable. So against those principles and ideas, the bill seeks to reform prescription. And I'd like to focus my remarks on the discoverability test and the exceptions to the five-year period. The discoverability test is used to determine when the prescriptive period starts. And, and recently, two important cases at the Supreme Court have altered that interpretation, one of which has already been uh, mentioned, which was uh, Morrison against ICL Plastics, uh, and also uh, Gordon and others against Campbell, Riddle, Breeze, Patterson in 2017. Uh, these held that the five-year period started when the pursuer knew or reasonably should have known that the loss occurred, regardless of whether they knew it had uh, been caused by fault or negligence. This bill changes that test to meet three conditions. That the pursuer knew that loss had occurred, uh, that they knew that the loss was caused by another person's act or mission, and, and the identity of that person. Uh, we on the Labour bench believe that this is reasonable and a sensible compromise position, which means that pursuers are not placed in a harsh situation where their claim could be invalid before they even knew or had discovered that they had a claim. There are two notable exceptions to the five-year prescription period, and they have been acknowledged previously by uh, previous speakers, that being council tax and non-domestic rates. Members may well have been contacted by constituents, as I have, around issues arising from council tax debt, where people are frustrated that councils who have failed to actively enforce the debt for several years suddenly come down on them like a pile of bricks on, uh, uh, upon their debtor and who may have been paying what they thought was the correct amount for years. Indeed, Citizens Advice Scotland told the committee a five-year prescription period would force all creditors uh, to actively try to pursue and enforce their debt, which would perhaps put off the need for things such as sequestration by councils. We should not let policy be led by the inability of councils to enforce their debt nor should the law encourage inefficiency by council and public bodies to actively pursue those debts. Now, the government's argument is that this exception retains the status quo, but that does not persuade me or us on these benches. The bill, unsurprisingly, is about changing that status quo where necessary. So the justification to exempt council tax and business rates should be made on the merits of that case, not because it has always been so. So in conclusion, presiding officer, prescription is an important principle in need of reform. Labour looks forward to further debate on this bill, and we are happy to support this bill at stage one, but look forward to seeing how it can be improved at future stages. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur to open for the Liberal Democrat Party. Four minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Could I, like uh, Daniel Johnson, start by uh, acknowledging the contribution made by um, the Justice Secretary's predecessor, Michael Matheson, and Annabel Ewing. Um, I, I'm sure the current Justice Secretary will have uh, advised um, uh, his predecessor uh, that in moving to uh, transport, uh, he has not got rid of me yet, uh, as I beat a path to his door, uh, firstly on the issue of ferries, but uh, thereafter on many other issues, I am sure. But I look forward to working with uh, Hamza Youssef in his new uh, role. Uh, unlike most of the colleagues, well, um, except uh, Daniel Johnson, I'm painfully conscious that I've not had the advantage of many colleagues in the chamber this afternoon of listening to the stage one uh, evidence. Uh, 
that's never ideal, but on a bill, as uh, Graeme Simpson uh, acknowledged, is highly technical in nature. Uh, it does make me rather uh, nervous, as I'm sure the Justice Secretary feels uh, himself to be as well. Nevertheless, having read the committee's report, and I paid tribute to the work done by the committee, uh, as well as the many briefings from uh, stakeholders, for which I'm uh, more than usually grateful, uh, there are a small number of points I wish to raise um, uh, in, uh, in the brief contribution uh, this afternoon. Firstly, I think it's worth confirming that Scottish Liberal Democrats welcome this bill. It is, uh, I think, a very welcome attempt to modernise uh, and bring greater clarity to the law uh, in relation to prescription. It seems self-evident that establishing a cut-off point for claims to be raised or rights to be asserted has the advantage of providing certainty. In turn, both individuals and businesses have some prospect of being able to organise their affairs and plan for the future. Uh, even prospective uh, pursuers benefit, it seems to me, from the enforced discipline of making any claim in a timely fashion. As the Law Society points out, quote, many years after the fact, evidence will have deteriorated or disappeared and relevant individuals may longer be traceable or indeed have passed away. So while this does not preclude the possibility of unfairness arising in individual cases, the principle underlying the bill appears to be, to be sound. Touching on a couple of specifics, I note first of all the, the lively debate around whether or not council tax and business rates uh, should be exempt from the five-year prescription. Again, in their briefing, the Law Society outlined half a dozen reasons why they believe this is not justifiable and may produce uh, unfair results. While I think the argument that councils, like others, should be required to do everything possible to pursue debts, uh, debts in a timely fashion, I struggle to accept that the 6% penalty charge that attaches to unpaid council tax would act as a disincentive on the collecting council. I can't see a council adopting a strategy, and that effectively would be what it would have to be, of deliberately delaying collections in order to rack up penalty charges. Indeed, the Law Society seem to acknowledge this and undermine their own argument when admitting that uncollected sums are quite small and if the Council has not sought to enforce within five years, there may be little practical appetite to pursue them many years later. Uh, I have more sympathy with Cosler's concern that introducing a five-year prescription would disincentivise payment and lead to a decline in in-year collection. That said, uh, I note the, com the committee was unable to reach an agreed position on this. I also uh, noted uh, Daniel Johnson's comments uh, and the, the committee is looking for further rationale for the exception uh, in advance of stage two. And that, to me, again, seems a sensible strategy and I will, uh, like others, look with interest to the responses that are forthcoming. In relation to the discoverability test, the Bill's proposals to start the five-year period only when a pursuer knows they have uh, suffered a damage, injury or loss, uh, it was the fault of someone else by act or omission, and they can identify that party on balance, offers more upsides than downsides, particularly in terms of legal certainty. Finally, let me flag a concern again highlighted by the Law Society about the treatment of existing obligations that may be affected by the new law. In a bill aimed at delivering clarity, the confusion around claims that are prescribed under existing law but not under the new law is not uh, helpful. Uh, I hope the government will be able to address that at stage two. For now, I thank the committee uh, as well as those who gave evidence and confirmed Scottish Liberal Democrats will support the bill at decision time. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. Stuart McMillan, followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I'm delighted to be speaking in, uh, today. And uh, first of all, I actually want to put my record my thanks and appreciation to uh, Michael Matheson and also to Annabelle Ewing, uh, particularly uh, Annabelle Ewing's dedication, uh, not just for this bill, but also on previous occasions where she's came in and provided evidence to the DPLR committee. Uh, I welcome the bill uh, and as, the, as a committee uh, we do recommend the Parliament agrees to the recommendations of it in paragraphs 52, 56 and 57 of our committee report provide that clear indication uh, that this bill is a step forward and will provide clarity of understanding but also that stakeholders are generally content with its proposals. Now, for something that started off as a fairly technical bill, it certainly came to life when we received evidence from uh, Mike Daly of the Government Law Centre. And certainly we've already heard some, uh, uh, some commentary about that uh, so far, and I'm quite sure uh, Mr Finlay will no, no doubt touch upon it in his contribution later. But the, the, certainly the Minister and, the, uh, and certainly uh, the Solicitor General have already touched upon the technical nature. Uh, sorry, well, the... Uh, and the Minister, the, the, the Convener, uh, and also the Solicitor General have already touched upon the technical nature of the bill, which has been helpful, but uh, I want to touch upon a couple of other areas. The Scottish Law Commission have brought forward uh, three bills in recent years, and previously have raised the, 
suggestion where possible, uh, could there be the potential for more than one uh, small technical area of legislation to be brought together to help progress dealing with outstanding issues? And I still believe uh, that actually would be beneficial on occasion. But this bill, however, highlighted a different scenario regarding the SLC consultation process. As the bill is technical, then the, the examining of some areas, such as welfare rights, might not have been fully pursued. And this became evident once we started our deliberations, and our executive summary actually highlights this. And although the, the welfare rights sector uh, were contacted during the SLC consultation, it was only as we actually undertook our work that we established some issues uh, really affecting them. Our recommendation that the SLC, in a quote, review its consultation process with a view to giving greater policy considerations a greater level of attention when deliberating on law reforms is therefore something that I firmly believe would be beneficial. The section three of the bill and its exceptions clearly uh, are the main focus of our report and considerations. Now, we couldn't agree as to whether the exception for council tax and business rates was appropriate. Now, with councils clearly wanting the status quo and the evidence from Mike Daly suggesting it should be cut, then there was very little other evidence. Then we had to try to, to test what was actually being suggested. Now, our writing to both COSLA and SOLAR, as well as the four other committees of this parliament, was an action uh, and we believed uh, the, to, to actually to, to write to test any new evidence, and that was the right thing to do. Now, the COSLA response was helpful, but as we indicate in the report, it wasn't politically signed off. Thus, our decision, therefore, to write to all 32 councils is also the correct thing to do. Attempting to establish exactly the situation of debt broken down into like five yearly periods will be advantageous for further understanding and the deliberation of this section and the bill. And the cause of response, however, it did indicate that the collection period, well, if it was reduced in 20 to five years then, the higher instalments would have to be applied therefore having a detrimental effect upon debtors. Now the very same people we actually all want to protect. Ultimately, we all want the bill to be right. Now we all, I'm sure, actually have a great deal of sympathy with the arguments proposed by Mike Daly. However, a few things need to be considered, in my opinion. Firstly, is this the correct bill to attempt to change that part of the law? Secondly, why should this bill hamper the ability and flexibility of local authorities in collecting unpaid council tax? And the reduction from 20 years to five years is vast, so what should the effects actually be? And so therefore, our letter to the councils will hopefully provide some further information to help you. And as the Solicitor General uh, touched upon, or sorry, as the Minister indicated in reply to the committee, a report that the 20-year prescription will no longer be capable of interruption by a relevant claim or acknowledgement and will therefore act as a true long stop. Ultimately, presiding officer, course. I'm delighted that this uh, technical bill has been recommended to progress and I look forward to the next stages of the bill's journey in Parliament. Thank you. Call Bill Bowman to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank my colleague, Graham Simpson, the convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and the committee clerks for their work on this bill. Having substituted on the committee for my colleague, Alison Harris, whilst the bill was being discussed, I'm grateful to be able to add my voice today. The bill enjoys support in and out of Parliament, with the convener recognising the general contentment amongst stakeholders. The Law Society of Scotland summed it up, noting that it would modernise and bring greater clarity to our law of prescription. It will do so through a series of changes to the five-year and 20-year prescription. It is not an attempt at wholesale reform, but rather it aims to address specific issues which have caused or may cause difficulty in practice. More fundamentally, it aims to clarify, sorry, to bring clarity, certainty and fairness while balancing the law between creditors and debtors. With that in mind, the committee has recognised the need to address various issues before the bill reaches stage two, such as cases involving council tax, benefit overpayments and situations where a 20-year prescription can cause, result, can cause a result in harsh can result in harsh results for individual cases, too much harshness. On council tax, the committee split on whether it should be exempt from the five-year rule, the disagreement coming down to balancing perceptions of fairness with public policy. No one wants to see individuals treated unfairly, but we have a public duty to treat taxpayers fairly by recovering their money, which serves a wider public good, a point that I hope sees this issue receive the attention and review it deserves as the bill progresses. 
That process is already underway. The committee will write to local authorities to ascertain how many still have council tax and business rates debts outstanding after five years and how often payment has been sought using the 20-year prescription. I welcome this engagement, but we must ensure the process is kept on track and that responses are acted upon. In a similar vein, more discussion is needed on whether overpayment of benefits should be subject to a five-year or a 20-year prescription. Avoiding overpayments is the best solution, but where it happens, there is again the question of fairness versus the wider public good. Some regard 20 years is too long, but to paraphrase a clever man than me, time is relative. Public finances do not obey neat demarcations of time, and we must ensure that we, we retain flexibility in safeguarding public money. Regarding the 20-year rule itself, there is always going to be a need for longer prescription periods, even as we recognize the problems it can create, such as gathering evidence after a number of years. The bill balances that necessity by strengthening the hand of defenders through much earlier prescription starting points in many cases, and preventing court proceedings from reset, resetting the clock on the 20-year period. That measure in particular is a welcome boost as it offers greater certainty to defenders. Certainty is the fundamental point. People must be able to live their lives without fear that they will forevermore be open to lawsuits. So even if individual cases might throw up some unwelcome developments, there is a wider public interest in legal certainty that must be served. But of course, individual cases can be better served too, as the Law Society points out, by claimants taking early action. Presiding officer, people have a right to claim what is lawfully theirs, but they also have a right not to be dragged through the courts to settle decades-old debts. The reforms before us help achieve that through increased clarity and better balance between parties. However, as we move towards stage two, I hope ministers will pay heed to the concerns raised by the committee and seek to address them in a manner that carries parliament with them. That would allow the bill to continue focusing on the substantive issues and ensure the continuation of the broad support seen today. Thank you. I'd appreciate it if the last two open debate speakers could come in just under four minutes, please. Mark Griffin, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, we welcome the Prescription Scotland Bill, the new discoverability test that requires a person to be aware that their loss, injury or damage was caused by a person's act or a mission and to know the identity of that person before the start of the five-year period is fairer than the current law. However, it's disappointing that while the bill seeks to simplify prescription and ensure that all debts, with few exceptions, arising from personal contracts or statute should be covered by the five-year rule, the government has been persuaded to exempt certain statutory creditors. In particular, the exemption of council tax and benefit payments under UK legislation from five-year subscription making them subject, subject to 20-year subscription leaves people vulnerable to high penalties many years after they first incurred them, even when they might not have been aware of them. And given the six-year prescription that covers council tax and the overpayment of benefits in England, England and Wales, this bill fails to provide that simplicity, fairness and clarity, particularly for those accessing devolved and reserved benefits. Um, Earlier, when I tried to intervene on the Solicitor General, I wasn't trying to catch her out in unfamiliar uh, surroundings. I did want uh, to ask a, a question, uh, seeking gen genuine clarity, and that is around the debt which will be transferred from the UK government to the Scottish government. With the devolution of the new social security powers coming to this parliament, the debt associated with historic claims will also transfer to this parliament and to this government. And it was simply to ask and maybe if the Solicitor General could cover in conclusion um, what system that debt transferred for, from one government to another government will operate under um, if this bill has uh, mm -hmm. successfully passes through all stages in this parliament. But Mike um, Holmyard from Citizens Advice Scotland told the committee that uh, the position was, was unfair. He gave examples of problems with obtaining adequate evidence from both the, the debtor and from local authority collection systems. Um, he explained that the, the way council tax is collected then exacerbates the difficulties debtors have in understanding their council tax debt and that citizens advice advisors see clients who have built up debts of 
um, over a period of 10, 11, 12 years, uh, apparently without the council having taken any previous action to collect those debts. And then people obviously can't understand how the council can apparently go from no effort to collecting those debts over such a long period uh, to go into then uh, such drastic action to recover um, those debts. Um, similar issue, issues arise in relation to, to benefit overpayments um, under the UK legislation. Um, under the, the bill in its cover, current form, a, diversion between, a divergence between devolved and reserved benefits would result from the way in which Section 3 of the proposed bill interacts with Section 66 of the Social Security Act. Uh, the combined effect of the two provisions is that the five-year prescription would apply to devolved Social Security benefits, but 20-year prescription would apply to uh, reserved benefits. Um, President officer, I will conclude there um, and say, just in closing, that um, we welcome uh, this bill, but I think there are certain areas that we would be looking at again at stage two. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Tom Arthur. President officer, I'd like to begin by joining colleagues from across the chamber in paying tribute to Annabel Ewing. I had the privilege of being parliamentary liaison officer to both Michael Matheson and Annabel Ewing earlier on in this session. I wish Annabel Ewing the very best and I congratulate Michael Matheson on his new post. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak in support of the Prescription Scotland Bill at Stage 1. As this bill originates from the work of the Scottish Law Commission, it is naturally of a more technical nature than many other matters we debate in this chamber. And given that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee was appointed lead committee, the proposal contained within this bill are situated closer to the consensual end of the spectrum of political debate. However, given the implications of a law prescription has in a broad range of areas, this bill has provoked some broader questions, particularly on the recovery of debt by public bodies. Two areas of contention which emerge from the committee's del deliberations are reflected at paragraphs 111 and 144 of the committee's stage one report, which concern council tax and benefits respectively. I will focus my remarks on the issue of debt to local authorities. Currently, the prescription period is a prescription period, rather, as it applies to both council tax and, and non-domestic rates, is uncertain. It is probable that the 20-year prescription period applies. However, there is no decided case on the point, which could offer more certainty, as has already been noted. Where I believe there is consensus is in seeing this bill um, as an opportunity to bring clarity. Where there is contention is on whether the period of prescription should be five or 20 years. Advocates of both five and 20 years have offered strong arguments. Those who advocate a five-year prescription period include the Law Society of Scotland and Mike Daly from the Government Law Centre. The Law Society contend a 20-year period is unfair and their reasoning is set out in paragraph 86 of the committee report, which states that non-payment of council tax attracts a high penalty charge so that the value of the debt grows over time in situations where people in good faith believe that they have paid their council tax yet are chased for the debt many years later, particularly in situations where joint and several liability applies. Mike Daly argues that the position in Scotland should equate with that in England where action to recover council tax debt must be initiated within six years. Mr Daly offered a further nuance to his position with a, where a compromise could be affected by having, and I quote from paragraph 90, a five-year prescription with an exceptional circumstance test to establish whether there had been deliberate behaviour on behalf of the debtor to create a delay in enforcing debt. Those advancing retention of 20-year prescription included both Solar and COSLA, though I should state that COSLA's response to the committee had not been politically endorsed. Both organisations highlight the importance of local taxation to councils and the need for a legal regime that allows effective collection of debt. A further argument the committee considered was that of parity between the local and national governments with regard to the prescribed period for debt recovery. While I am sympathetic to the arguments made by the Law Society and Mike Daly, I am not as of yet convinced that the bill under consideration today is the appropriate vehicle for delivering significant reform of local authority debt collection. There are three reasons that have uh, led me to this view. Firstly, there has um, so far been insufficient consultation with relevant stakeholders regarding the implications for any reform. Though, as my colleague Stuart McMillan um, referred to earlier, efforts have been undertaken in that regard. Secondly, on a practical level, the process of council debt recovery is normally commenced swiftly, and the consequential is uh, issuance of a summary warrant creates an effective 20 year prescription period. It should be noted that this compares favourably to the English equivalent of a liability order, which, um, as an instrument of English law, is indefinite owing to the lack of prescription in that jurisdiction. 
Thirdly, and lastly, I believe that there is a risk of the bill going beyond its SLC-inspired remit and trespassing into policy areas that should be the concern of other committees in this Parliament beyond DPLR. Presenting officer, time limits me from going uh, into further detail on the issues of benefits. However, I do look forward to hearing the government's response to the issues raised in this debate as we go forward. Thank you. We now move to the, the closing speeches, and I call Neil Finlay. Uh, up to four minutes, please. Yeah, thanks, President Officer, and can I welcome the new ministers, although I, th I think they've departed, uh, and uh, thank the uh, outgoing ministers for their uh, public service. I uh, can also thank the uh, Solicitor General and the convener for setting out uh, the committee and the government's uh, position on this bill and highlighting some of the key issues uh, uh, from the bill. Uh, there are welcome changes on uh, discoverability and other technical aspects that we've heard about during the debate. But I want to focus on how this uh, bill and the issues around it impact on people. Um, I, in a past life, worked for six years as a housing officer in the social housing sector. I was a frontline housing officer, working with tenants of housing associations and councils. And I took a great interest in the welfare right side of the job, trying to ensure that people received their entitlement, but also that the council or housing association was paid the rents and housing benefit that they were owed. Uh, that job was a tremendous apprenticeship for getting into politics as you see people's lives in the raw and going in and out of people's houses every day and helping them deal with the financial pressures means you understand the stresses and strains put on families and communities. You get an understanding of the crushing impact that debt can have on relationships and mental and physical health and general well-being. And as a housing officer, I had to take in, I had to, in cases of extreme debt, invoke an eviction process, which ultimately meant people lost their homes. And housing officers in Scotland are faced with that awful dilemma every day. It is very uh, grim. It's the worst part of the job. And actually, it's evidence of failure of policy. And in my experience, many debts came on the back of problems within the benefits system, from either people having their benefits stopped, benefits reduced, or with overpayments accruing through errors in the system. And I say this against the backdrop of this bill. And particularly in relation to the exemption of council tax and reserved uh, overpayments under UK legislation, uh, meaning that people will be subject to a 20-year 20, 20 prescription period and possible higher penalties uh, after that debt is discovered. Um, these people might not be aware of that debt. They might have long disposed of any files or records that they have at home that would help them address that debt when they have discovered they have it. Um, Six-year period covers council tax and overpayments in England and Wales, but it would be 20 years in Scotland. In relation to uh, uh, the poll tax, the Scottish Government took the correct action to write off historic poll tax debts after almost 30 years. But now under this system, if it is enacted, people will have council tax debt hanging over them for up to 20 years. Now, let's think about that. If the benefit system was starting from scratch and the UK government was starting all over again and proposed a six-year debt recovery period in England but a 20-year period in Scotland, there would be rightly an outcry. But that is what's being proposed by what is in the bill. We've heard from the Govan Law Centre, Mike Daly made a very uh, positive contribution to our proceedings as did the CAB and we've had written evidence from the Child Poverty Action Group. All of them share my belief that the law and prescription in Scotland for council tax and reserve benefits over payments should be brought more in line with England and Wales and my Labour colleagues have said that today. So we, we believe that a five-year prescription period brings us more in line with what's happening in England and Wales and I have to say that if we don't see any movement in this uh, during uh, the progress of the bill then we will bring forward such an amendment at stage two. Thanks, President Officer. Call Gordon Lindhurst for up to five minutes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In a debate of this nature, it may seem that my right to say anything interesting by this stage has been extinguished by prescription. Uh, so let me start by saying, mentioning my entry in the Register of Interest as a practicing advocate. Uh, prescription may seem to be a boring lawyer's topic, uh, these lawyers with their pedantic pronunciations. 
Uh, it is, of course, an ancient uh, topic known to legal systems the world over, and it hardly needs to be mentioned that the Romans, with their usa capio and other rules, were the basis of much of present-day European thinking on the matter. When I was at Heidelberg University, I remember a professor teaching us about the subject and telling a story to illustrate its meaning. He told, as a student, of purchasing a bottle of something, I'll let others guess what was in the bottle, um, as he only gave a receipt to the shopkeeper and didn't actually pay for it at that stage. And he thought, as a student, what a convenient arrangement this was. Um, however, he said it would not be convenient if, more than 40 years later, the shopkeeper came calling and demanded payment of the bill for that bottle. And the professor's point was simply this. An agreement should not be left as if forgotten and forgiven, only to be trundled out years later and a demand presented when circumstances, situations, and even fortunes may have completely changed. It was Eleanor Roosevelt who once said, and I quote, justice cannot be for one side alone, but must be for both. So prescription is about that balance of justice, which seeks to be fair to both parties setting a limit to the time beyond which a right cannot be relied upon. In vox, pop, perhaps, use it or lose it. These are well-established, widely accepted principles in the legal systems of the world, past, present, and one would hope, future. As my illustration from the professor indicates, the question of prescription is, however, one that applies across a wide breadth of human life and experience. I did a short trawl through Scottish case law of the past couple of centuries, and a huge number of issues were covered, ranging from salmon fishing to boundary disputes to every other conceivable form of commerce. I certainly will not bore the parliament with a, uh, a tale of each and every one of these, <laughs> these cases. However, um, it, the subject even featured in a case relating to the interpretation of the Temperance Scotland Act 1913, the case of McFarlane against Lanarkshire County Council 1921 session cases 664. Now this was in relation to a poll conducted and the question of whether it had, had or had not taken place on a market day, which would have been prohibited under the Act. The Lord President in that case commented, and I quote again, to shut all licensed premises in the area on the day of a poll, which is concerned with the question of licensing policy, is an intelligible precaution against influence, while to shut them on a market day is to cause needless inconvenience and annoyance. The Act of Parliament is framed in view of both these considerations." End quote. So it is that, um, certainly, Mr. Finlay. Neil Finlay. Could I ask the member if he's lifted Stuart Stevenson's speech today? <laughs> Gordon Lindhurst. <laughs> what can I say? I've been found out. <laughs> uh, no, not on this occasion, Mr. Finlay. So I go on to say it is that need to balance the rights and obligations of creditors and debtors that the bill before us is aimed to achieve, and also to achieve desirable clarity in the current prescription regime, because fairness requires that clarity, not just the balancing of interests. And of course, it is in fact that particular aspect, clarity where the bill has been, or the current law has been found to be wanting in a number of respects. Um, so the bill is to be welcomed, for we all need to know where we stand when it comes to our rights and obligations, and we need to know within a reasonable time. Any lack of clarity in prescriptive rules is undesirable. There are, of course, points that need to be looked at very carefully, and these have been covered not only by my colleagues, but the committee and others who've spoken here today. The Section 5 discoverability test, particularly where the burden is being moved to be placed on the pursuer rather than the defender, and there can be complexity in relation to multiple defenders. The question in relation to heritage, prescriptive rights, the 20-year prescription, and the failure to correctly reflect in the land register rights and obligations. And Finally, as a point, the one raised and so eloquently um, talked about, perhaps in a lifted speech from um, Mr. Stevenson by Mr. Finlay himself, 
that to do with recovery of taxes and obligations to the state? And the question, of course, raised by Mr. Findlay, should that and why should that be a longer period than in relation to private individuals? I call Alison Dirolo to wind up the debate. Uh, seven minutes, please, Solicitor General. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I don't want to turn this into a mutual appreciation society, but can I also add my thanks and tributes to the outgoing Justice Ministers and to the members of the committee, the DPA LRC committee, who've given such obvious, uh, close and intelligent, if I may say so, uh, consideration to this bill. Because at first sight, it does seem a technical bill, a driable, but it's anything but. And I think we, we can understand from Neil Finlay's um, positive contribution there that, that it, this is about improving Scotland's statute book. So it's black letter law, it's technical to that extent, but it matters. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, delighted uh, that uh, it has been given the uh, amount of scrutiny that it clearly has. And I want to thank all members today in the chamber for their various contributions to what is an important debate, and it's a valuable debate. And it's confirmed that there is support across this chamber for the general principles of this bill, and that, that surely is to be welcomed. Yes, there have been issues raised. This is, in essence, a matter of balance of um, rights and interests um, of, of various uh, parts of society. And it's clear that those balances, um, balancing exercises have been carried out from the genesis of this piece of work in the Scottish Law Commission right through its consideration to today. Those issues that have been raised, and I'm going to just touch on two or three of them in the time allowed, will of course receive the close consideration that they, concern, they, they deserve going forward. Perhaps the first matter to mention, Daniel Johnson and Graham Simpson and others have all um, referred to this, is the, the fact that the bill doesn't change the uh, position of council tax and so far expressed its aim is to simply maintain the status quo. Um, how did we get to that position? Because that, that is a considered position. Um, the exception maintains the status quo. That is an exception um, in relation to council tax debt. Um, following an early publication of the, one of the first drafts, the Scottish Law Commission immediately received representations from um, local authorities. And among the points they made were that um, the policy reasons which justify accepting taxes payable to HMRC um, and Revenue Scotland apply equally to taxes payable to local authorities. Now, it was acknowledged that there were few cases, there would be few cases um, that would take more than five years uh, to collect these local taxes. Um, but the point of principle, I think, was made and was made well. And certainly the Scottish Law Commission, taking a, 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 a an overview of all of this, the Scottish Law Commission was persuaded by the arguments that, um, yes. Daniel Johnson. Uh, just given the fact that the situation is different south of the border, I was wondering if any evidence had been looked at whether or not there had been negative consequences for the six year prescription period for local authorities in England. Alison Dirolo. I don't think that comparative exercise has been done. The, the, the scope of this bill is actually is perhaps not as, as great, and we've already had comments. I think Tom Arthur mentioned this. This bill is about amending, reforming, uh, clarifying the law and prescription in Scotland. It's not about wholesale reform of debt recovery and arrangements um, for, for collection of, of taxes and revenues. So um, the, ans the answer is no to that, that particular question. But we know that more than £2 billion worth of council tax debt is currently owed across Scotland. £1.2 billion of this relating to debts more than five years old. So making the prescription period for debts, um, those debts five years would, would likely force a change in the way councils recover the debt, and that would be to the detriment of the debtor, again, about whom Neil Finlay has spoken so, so passionately. COSLA made clear in their letter to the DPLRC committee there would be an increase in impetus to uh, local authorities to secure repayment within this reduced period. So there are, there are competing issues, there are arguments to be made uh, in both respects, but uh, the Scottish Government, like the Scottish Law Commission, is satisfied that the exemption is justified. 
Can I mention briefly, Deputy Presiding Officer, the exception to the five-year prescription period for Social Security? And again, this is a question of maintaining the status quo, which is that 20-year negative prescription applies. Um, in England and Wales, the analogous legal concept is actually limitation rather than prescription, so the debt may still be active after that time. The DWP is crystal clear in their evidence to the committee that making reserved benefit overpayments subject to the five-year prescription would impose greater hardship on the most vulnerable members of society. And that, that's, a, that's a key message which um, has been delivered to the Scottish Law Commission and to the committee um, repeatedly, and it's part of that balancing exercise. I'm sure that the committee, um, as outlined in their report, uh, are keen to ensure that that hardship is not imposed on the most vulnerable in our society. It may be that... Yeah. Neil Findlay. Uh, that that may, may be the DWP's position, but I would find it very unusual if the uh, Citizens Advice Bureau, the Government Law Centre and the Child Poverty Action Group were arguing to have a harsher regime for poor and vulnerable people in Scotland. I find that very difficult to believe. Solicitor General. Mike Daly and, the, and other consultees have, have given their views, and this is a complex, nuanced matter with different, different shades, but there is no question but that consultation resulted in the view being expressed that uh, uh, removal of the exception would cause greater hardship. So these are balancing exercises, as I repeat. Um, the uh, committee and the Law Commission are, are aware of all of these and the Scottish Government is satisfied that the balance has... has I, I must press on just to finish. Thanks um, very much. Um, the final matter which I'll mention, presiding officer, and uh, Daniel Johnson and Tom Arthur um, have mentioned it and Alison Harris gave us a, a helpful explanation about the discoverability and joint and several liability. Um, the Scottish Government also consulted SLC on this point and the bill doesn't change the law on joint and several liability. But this proposed new discoverability test, and I'm heartened to hear um, universal approval of the clarity that it brings, improves, again, the position of creditors generally in relation to latent damages. And a, it's significant that Brodie's, in their contribution to the committee, were clear in their view that the reform of this part of the Act will be welcomed. It's an opportunity to clarify the essential facts which a party must be aware of before a five-year prescriptive period starts to run um, in respect of an obligation to, to pay damages. So this bill, uh, presiding officer, does remedy um, a wrong um, or a, a defect that Morrison against ICL uh, brought about and, and I'm again heartened to here across the chamber consensus that that is to be welcomed. Presiding officer, I think to conclude now there are, there are many, many more issues in this technical but fascinating bill. I would simply like to thank members again for their contribution to today's debate. It's clear that many if not all of you support the general principles of this important bill to provide fairness, clarity and certainty to those areas of the law of negative pre prescription that have caused practical difficulties in its operation. The bill, therefore, is an opportunity for this Parliament to protect those who have a claim from running out of time in which to proceed with it, to change the current situation of possible perpetual liability to those claims, including those who have historical council tax debt, and to make clearer which obligations prescribe after five years. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on the prescription Scott.